Um, all right, so today I'm going to be talking about the use of aerogels in windows. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just sort of review where we are. So I just have a little slide on each of the lectures so far, just to remind you. So the first one was uh, when Professor Carroll was here, and that was the introduction to sol gel chemistry. And we talked about how to make, in this case, as an example of a silica aerogel. She focused on silica aerogels. And the main things there were that there's this sort of hydrolysis reaction and a condensation reaction. And you go from, you know, these liquid chemicals to a wet gel, a wet sol gel. People call them different things. People call them alka gels. We have this solid clusters of silica surrounded by solvent. And then she also introduced some of these uh, chemical symbols um, for the chemicals we use to make silica aerogels which are tetramethyl orthosilicate and tetraethyl orthosilicate. TOS and TMOS used um, in brief. So that's kind of what happened on the first lecture. And then after that, I talked about the drying methods that are used. And the main challenge is to, this is a phase diagram. And the main challenge is to avoid going directly from a liquid to a vapor that evaporation process, which because the aerogels are so, it's a nanostructure, the forces that act on them will crush or destroy the structure and you won't maintain the aerogel structure. And I've talked about the three methods, the freeze drying, where you go around uh, this vaporization line or the supercritical extraction where you go up and over it. And you nev you're never in a situation where you have a phase boundary between a liquid and a vapor when you do that. And then there are techniques to do the evaporation called ambient pressure drying, but you have to treat your surface in order to do that. And this sort of kind of ended with the slide that sort of shows you the steps. You know, you always have to start with mixing your chemicals. And if you go to one of the rapid supercritical methods, which is one we use. That's all you do. You mix them and you put them in the in and you process them immediately. Uh, for any of the other techniques, you do more. I should so in this process, we gel and age during it. The other techniques, you you wait for your uh, precursors to gel, and then when and, and people often add an aging step, which is just a continued reaction to strengthen the bonds. And once you've done that, you can do some different methods. You can go straight to uh, freeze drying, or you can do some solvent exchanges and then freeze dry. So they do it both ways. Um, solvent exchange is absolutely required for doing the ambient pressure, dry, uh, sorry, the CO2 supercritical extraction, which is the most commonly used method. But again, it's a lot more complicated to go here versus just straight across with the rapid method. And then if you're going to do ambient dry, you've got to do all kinds of, of not only solvent exchanges, but silylation, which is, is adding like a surfactant or something to that wet gel that allows it to become more elastic and come back. So, so sort of the, the, the steps involved in all of that. And I talked about the um, rapid supercritical extraction process that we use at Union College. I'm going to talk a little more about that today because one of the things I'm going to get into is um, how to make bigger aerogels because that's what we faced when we tried to make the windows. So I won't talk about it now, but that's the, the hot, that's a picture of the hot press. And this is our procedure in blue, what's happening to the wet gel is it's going around the supercritical point of the methanol. Then in the third lecture, uh, Professor Carroll talked about some different types of aerogels and got into some of the interesting aerogel chemistries. You know, she talked about these silica aerogel composites, and she had a nice example of the different things that people have made. Um, here's some example of the catalytic aerogels that we make, and I'll, I'll be talking about those next week. 
And then uh, she showed some examples of these, these carbon-based aerogels. Okay, then after that, we got into properties. We did th three things on properties. The first lecture was focused on the microstructural. Remember, we talked about porous media and the different types of pores that you can have. Uh, we talked about how do you calculate density because if you, the, you can get the mass of this thing pretty easily, just weigh it on a scale. But getting the volume is difficult because if you just do a bulk volume around the whole thing, you're encompassing all of these dead spaces that are the pores. They're not solid. So we talked about bulk volume, envelope volume, skeletal volume, and we talked about the difference between bulk and skeletal density. And then we got into the porous structure. Um, how do you, what methods can you use to figure out the size of these pores? in there and the method is to use gas absorption right so we talked about here's your sort of a structure and we use a liquid we use nitrogen which add which condenses onto the structure when you get just one layer and you know you're at one layer then you can figure out what the surface area is and as you do multi-layer you can figure out the pore distribution so here was an example i showed this is you can't read any of these scales because they're too small but this is uh Pore volume, pore volume versus uh, pore diameter. And so this is an aerogel, peaks, uh, I don't know, 15 or so. The average is 13, sorry. And this is a zero gel. And this, uh, just, I showed this example. Uh, one, just to show you, you can get this sort of information using this system about the pores. And so an aerogel has pores, you know, in this range, just has a lot at this size. And it actually has pores outside this range, which is plotted up to 200 nanometers. Um, it just you can't measure those with this system. But a zero gel, something that you don't supercritically dry, ends up with much smaller pores because they collapse. Uh, and then we talked about mechanical properties and some imaging things. And I showed you the picture with the different types of imaging methods you can see. These are all images of aerogels. These two are silica aerogels. Uh, I think this one is an alumina aerogel, but you have what you can see with the SEM versus what you can see with a TEM. And a TEM, you can really get in close in an AFM. So you know, there's great imaging techniques you can use. Talked a little bit about spectroscopy, where we measure transmittance versus wavelength for different thicknesses of aerogel. And I'll be talking more about that today. And then we did the uh, crushing of the aerogel. Um, I like to show it because I like watching it crush. Uh, and so for the aerogels, you get a specific sort of stress strain curve here where it's sort of linearly elastic and then you get pore collapse in the gel and then it just densifies. So you get this sort of relationship between stress and strain. And I talked somewhat about the different products and different ways people have strengthened aerogels. And this is that product called Airloy, which um, is made by a company in, in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, not transparent, but a stronger structural uh, material. And then just, just just Wednesday, I talked about thermal and flow through characteristics uh, with aerogels. And so again, the thing is, is you have to think about things like tortuosity and connectivity and you know the different modes of heat transfer that go through and the, and the fact that you have this Knudsen effect where molecules hit poor walls more often than they hit each other, just due to the mean free path under those conditions. And so just a summary of all those properties that I finally got a better one because I added thermal conductivity to it. This is sil silica aerogels. You know, just, I like this sort of, you know, bulk density is low. Most common is about 0.1 gram per centimeter cubed. Surface areas determined by nitrogen adsorption, desorption are on the order of 600 to 1,000 for an aerogel considered percent solid. Typically, they're over 90, sometimes only 85% porous is what, what we're looking at there. Um, mean pore diameter, 10 to 20, and I just showed you one where it was 13, and that's nitrogen absorption. Particle diameter, the size of those primary particles, and that's from uh, electron microscopy. Index of refraction, I didn't talk about that, but it's very low for solid material. Thermal conductivity, I did talk about that. And we showed it varies with pressure. 
I didn't talk about thermal tolerance, but usually you can heat these things up um, to at least 500 degrees C and not see any damage. But if you go a lot higher than that, you'll start to see the uh, silica structure uh, get affected. Um, and melting point is about 1200 C. Uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, Poisson's ratio has to do with how if you push in one direction, how does it move in the other direction? Um, and we talked about the strength characteristics of those areas. I'll show them here. So this is just a nice summary. And so I have a couple of slides coming up that are derived from the fact that they have all these cool properties. And so over the years, I've worked with a lot of students who come to us and say, can I do X with an aerogel? Because they think they're cool. So I'm just going to show you some examples of those things. Um, and one of the can I do X is windows, and then I'll transition to that. So, oh, sorry. So these properties that we care about affect a lot of different things, right? Thermal conductivity is very important in insulating applications. Uh, light transmission is important in solar panels and windows. Dense, density is overall important for the weight. That surface area is important in chemical sensing applications and in catalysis applications, and same with the pore size. So I have had many students come and say, can I do these things? Can I insulate? Can I use them to insulate buildings? And so here's at the bottom is the project when we started trying to make them aerogels larger, and I'll get into details on that to make windows. And this is uh, this was one of my favorite projects. The students, these are the bachelor students. They built this house. That is an aerogel window. And then they used aerogel, and I'll talk about aerogels for building insulation on uh, Tuesday next week. They use sort of the aerogel blanket materials to insulate on the inside. You know, and then they took some pictures well, look what was happening in there. But you get a lot of this, can I use aerogels to do something? So insulate buildings. This is another one. This is not an area of research for me, but I thought it was a very interesting project that a student did. Again, this has to do with the low thermal conductivity. This student was a volunteer firefighter, uh, somebody who fights fires. And he wanted, you know, the firemen wear something like this and he wanted to see if he put in and it's made of an outer shell a moisture barrier and a thermal barrier and he wanted to say oh hey if i can i put aerogel in a fire coat and will it help because if you're a fireman in a room and there's a flashback like 10 seconds will help you. Even having that much time will help you. And the other advantage of the air, and these coats are pretty heavy. So they carry all, they're wearing this heavy equipment. And so an aerogel is nice and lightweight. So you could maybe incorporate an aerogel and get, get some um, more time uh, before you heat up. So he, he, we've only, he only did a few little experiments, but it was kind of an interesting thing. We made a, setup of uh, just that thing. He got the material and he built just a small thing with aerogel in there. He just looked at the time to reach uh, some important temperatures before you have damage. And so when he just did the regular as purchased coat, what they currently use, you know, it reached a damage temperature at, a, at about 40 seconds. But when I use pyrogel, which is a material, it's, which is the aerogel blankets produced uh, uh, either by Aspen or Cabot in there, he managed it, did, it took much longer to heat up. And basically he's measuring, he has a fire, a flame on one side and a thermocouple on the other side to get temperature. So it's, it's wow, preliminary, wow, we can get sort of 70 seconds of relief, which would be huge if it, this is just a little test, but you know, that sort of thing, just sort of proof of concept that this might be um, something feasible to use in these materials. And a lot, there's been a lot of work in there's some 
They use aerogels in uh, extreme weather gear. Like if you're going to go hiking in the mount, on Mount Everest, they do have aerogels in some of those. And in, in boots, they have some aerogel materials in them. So uh, this was another fun one. Uh, Professor Carroll talked a bit about making aerogels hydrophobic. Uh, and so if they're hydrophobic, could you put them on a boat, coat the surface of your boat, and go fast? Right? So that's sort of a project that again, that was literally a student came and said, "Can I do? Can I do this?" And I said, "You could put aerogels on a small thing and test it, but you not put it on your boat." But I've had many versions of this project. I did have a we had a radio controlled boat in a put in a swimming pool. And so he tried to measure, you know, handleability and stuff. And then I have this, this, this student is a swimmer. And you can see, see how it's like white, shiny. So he, he did some testing. Uh, this is drag coefficient versus different material, swimsuit material. And what you're trying to do in a study like this is to reduce the drag. And so he's got a Speedo LZR, a, a T tire, all different types, types of things. And then he's got these ones here are coated with, um, he called them the aero suit. Uh, he did not get definitive results because you can see our uncertainty bars are too high. We didn't have a very good water channel to do the measurements in. But he reported that when he swam, he felt a lot more buoyant. So because you've got the air and he felt it. So it's been kind of an interesting idea. And we did do a more, um, a, a closer look at aerogels on surfaces where we were able to get some definite good data and publish that. But this is an example. This is a spinning disc. So it just spins around. Uh, it's actually a viscometer, which is used to measure viscosity of materials. It's a spinning disc and you can measure the torque. Okay, so, so it's going to be more torque if it's a very viscous fluid. So we did that with a hydrophobic aerogel surface and we saw a large reduction in the torque. But the reason we saw it, if you see in this picture, so this this is this thing is in water and uncoated with hydrophobic aerogel looks like this coated with hydrophobic aerogel and it's hard to see but that's an air bubble so if you trap an air bubble on the bottom then it reduces the drag which is the idea so it's kind of a fun thing um uh, we work with a number of, of biochem students who are interested in pharmaceutical kinds of applications and so another thing that people have done is um, use aerogels as carrier for drugs of some sort and and can you control can you use the aerogel to control the release rate of something and so one of the things so our process is high temperature so not everything can can withstand the high temperature uh, but ibuprofen can so ibuprofen i don't know what you call it here it looks like that yes i do yeah pain it's a pain for yes um so it, so it can survive our process. So we've had students work on, on looking and seeing, okay, can we, can, we, can we make an aerogel with ibuprofen in it? And they use sort of some different techniques to probe uh, the aerogel to see if we have it with ibuprofen in it. And they've shown that they've done, they do. And then they've started to look at, um, how the how the ibuprofen comes out of the aerogel related to the hydrophobicity of the aerogel things like that. So we've done some work in that. And again, this is another thing where students like, oh, can we do this? There's a lot of work, people who make um, uh, aerogels using CO2 supercritical extraction, which is much lower temperature. So the drugs could survive the temperature except that they do all those washing steps solvent exchanges so 
then sometimes the, the drug comes out. So there's you know, kind of both. But anyway, we were happy to show we, we could do some, some of them. And then this, the last example, and this is what I'll talk about on the last day, is um, can we use aerogels to address air pollution issues? And this was a, actually it was this student who went on, he got his PhD. Um, his motive, he basically asked that question, can I do something with aerogels? And so we started, we do quite a bit of work on this. And the idea is because there's so much surface area on the aerogel, can you, as, can you put it in car exhaust? And as the car exhaust flows through, and that's why I'm interested in the flow through stuff, can you dope your aerogel with um, uh, metals? To catalyze reactions and how you know how is that and we are in fact doing that and then I this is a this is a cobalt aerogel which I always show because it's like one of the few blue ones we've made with you know that dye so so those are like a whole bunch of um, just examples I like to show because people are often motivated by you look at the list of properties, what can you do with those things and where could they be used? And so it's been fun because people always come up with these interesting different ideas. So for the rest, the last three lectures, so the rest of today, I'm going to talk about aerogel based windows. I'll do some background and heat on heat transfer and windows. I'm going to talk about the granular based aerogel windows and there's a lot of work done here at Perugia on that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about scaling up the rapid supercritical extraction method to make monolith-based uh, aerogel windows. And then on Tuesday, I'll talk. I'm going to go into some of the aesthetic stuff we've done with aerogel windows. Um, some of the examples you'll see today, eh, they're not that pretty. They're not that nice looking. That's the way we have to make them. But some of the things we've done to improve that, and I'll talk about insulation. And then the last one will be on the automotive pollution control application. Okay, so to start out with, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, heat transfer in uh, a window system, the things you care about. So there's energy flow is a product of, uh, through, a, through a window, is a function of temperature-driven heat transfer, solar gain, and infiltration. So temperature difference, right, just hot outside or it's cold outside, it's hot inside. There's going to be a temperature difference between the two parts uh, on either side of a window. And so heat is gained or lost through the product, through the window. The glazing is what we call the window assembly. You also have a frame around it. And that all happens just like what happens in an aerogel. It's conduction, convection, and radiation. And so the main point is that we use this U factor is um, a value used to, to describe how good a fenestration system is. So solar gain, you can have heat is gained through fenestration products by direct or indirect solar radiation. And the amount of gain through the products is measured in terms of a solar heat gain coefficient. So these are two things, U factor and SHGC that you care about uh, for windows. And then the other is infiltration. If your window's leaky, that's all that means. Right, if it leaks around, if you have a very old window and it's not sealed right, like the frame and the thing, I'm sure you've all experienced this, you can get infiltration through the cracks. So temperature-driven heat transfer, um, again, the loss in the gain is due to temperature differences. And we have the three conduction, convection, radiation. And so this would be a, this is called a double, a double glazed window. These are probably all double glazed, right? Two pieces of glass. So you, the glass itself, you can get conduction through the glass. Sometimes you have a spacer between the pieces of glass. You'll have a frame around it. You get conduction through all of that. And obviously, the walls are far more insulating than the windows, but people like windows. So, you know, I, I love windows. I'd like prefer to have all windows, but building codes don't allow it because they're not as insulating. 
So convection is going to happen outside and inside and in between the panes of glass. So anywhere, uh, anywhere there's air, sometimes they evacuate between the two panes of glass, and then you won't have any conduction, any convection in there. So one way of making a better window is to evacuate the space between the panes. Okay. And the con convection outside, you know, if it's windy, it'll affect the value. Indoors, it isn't usually as high. Uh, a value. Oops, sorry. Uh, outdoors, it's higher than indoors. Um, again, depends on the climate conditions. And then radiation can happen uh, between the glazing layers, or between the, the um, integrated glazing units and the interior and outdoor space. So you have you have radiation going on between the two surfaces and between the indoors, the indoor walls, and the outdoors, and whatever sees outdoors. So that U factor is the thing that quantifies the amount of heat transfer due to those processes. Um, the inverse of the, of the U factor, the resistance to heat transfer is called an R value. Okay, so a, you want a low U factor and a high R value. Okay, so this is a standard way to quantify the insulating value of a window. Again, it indicates the amount of heat flow through the product. And I'll talk about it in a minute. There's many components to it. Um, there's the glazing, the frame, etc. So it's the total heat transfer coefficient of a penetration system, including conductive, convective, and radiation for a given set of environmental conditions. So it depends on you know, the wind primarily and the sun and anything and what's at and kind of the situation where you are. And it represents the heat flow per hour in watts through each square meter of a fenestration product for a one degree C temperature difference between the indoor and outdoor. So the smaller the U factor of a material, the lower the rate of heat flow. And again, it will depend on the thermal properties of the materials in the fenestration product, as well as weather conditions, temperature difference, wind speed. So we talk about uh, total product U factor, um, which encompasses everything around the window. So there's center of glazing U factor, and it's just looking at the window itself. Um, or it depends on how many, so glazing is a piece of glass. So how many, yes, yes, that, that, that talk about um, the glazing, a glazing could have two pieces of glass, could have three pieces of glass. If you looked it up, I don't even know what it, it doesn't have a good, but the window part of that is the glazing, sometimes called an integrated glazing unit, IGU, it's what you've put together. So it's, it, it could be three pieces, two pieces, one piece, that's called the glazing. So the center of glazing U factor just has to do with the window, with the glass part. Yeah, just the just the window, not the frame would be the like the wood outside, right? Um, so it depends on how many layers in the glazing. What do you have between the pieces of glass in the in the glazing? Like, is it evacuated? Is it air? They often will fill them with argon or krypton to lower the thermal conductivity. Um, and then the characteristics, oh, that I haven't even talked about coatings. So you can also put coatings on glass to uh, help with radiation. So they're low emissivity coatings. So depending on how you're glazing, the glass part is constructed, uh, that will affect the center of glazing U factor. Yeah, but you also have, you could have edge effects, right? The heat transfer isn't completely in one direction. You have heat flow in three dimensions. And so that's what edge effects includes is how are they, uh, how does that impact the rest of it? Because you could have a great glazing, really insulating, but imagine it's like, covered in metal or so, you know, something else that's not insulating. So it's very much affected by that. In the frames and sashes, so sashes are like the configuration of the window it might have 
you know, wood across, you know, I don't know, just like spacers, you know, and the old ones had metal. <laughs> just not good. <laughs> I think about that. But um, in the frame, depending on what the frame is made up of, it will in, in affect that. So that part of it can take up um, a large amount of the window. Like just looking at these windows, there's a big a part in that fills that hole that is not glass. Okay, and that can be up to 30% of the product area. And that sometimes that can be good depending what it is. Wood is less conductive than the glass or can be, depending on how thick it is. So um, anyways, all of those things affect that. So you, mostly I'm going to be talking about center of glazing you factor because we deal just with the glass part so much. But the point I'm trying to get across is the whole thing is important. Okay, solar heat gain. So again, this comes from radiation, right? From the sun and the sky. And so, and obviously some places you want this in the winter time on a sunny day. I have a, um, a greenhouse, all glass. But in February when it's, five degrees C, I can sit in it and it will be 27 degrees C on the inside because primarily because I have radiation coming in, solar heat gain. So sometimes you want it and sometimes you don't, right? I want that in the winter. I don't want that in the summer. So um, so the rate, so we have this radiation. Again, here's my glazing, a double glazed window. So two panes. And I have radiation coming from the surroundings. Some of it's reflected back. Some of it's transmitted through. Some of it's absorbed. Some gets absorbed in the window itself. Um, and, you know, it may go through one, two, or three pieces of glass, depending on your glazing. Uh, but and some will get inside. So this is also really important knowing what this is when you're looking at a, a window system because it really it really affects the air conditioning load on something right in the summer we've got to combat that so depending on the climate you might want a low solar heat gain or you might want a high solar heat gain unfortunately where i live and here too some part times of the year i want a high and some place want a low but it, it is what what it is and you have to be aware of it. So again, it's coming from the, from the sunlight, which has, you know, this is just a energy intensity versus wavelength. And this is just meant to show here's the visible range of light. And about half the sun's energy is in that range. And so this characteristic of sunlight makes it possible to selectively admit or reject different portions of that spectrum. If you don't want this infrared, um, you can use coatings on um, glass to do some of that. So the thing that we use to represent that is just a non-dimensional number called the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, so it represents the solar heat gain through the system relative to the incident. So it's the amount percent that gets in. Um, it can be determined for any angle of incidence, right? Depends on how your, your window looks relative things. But most commonly what's reported is normal incident solar radiation. Again, it's expressed as a dimensionless number from zero to one and a high solar Heat gain coefficient means high heat gain and a low means low heat gain. And so what I was just saying is while reducing solar radiation through fenestration products is a benefit in some climates and during some seasons, maximizing it can be a significant energy benefit under winter conditions. Okay, and then the last thing about a window we care about, this doesn't really affect uh, uh, the um, heating and cooling loads, but visible transmittance, it can affect the lighted load. 
So visible transmittance is the amount of light in the visible portion of the spectrum that passes through the glazing material. So it doesn't directly affect heating and cooling loads, but it's an important factor in evaluating fenestration products. So when you do things like put low emissivity coatings on a window, it makes it much darker. So you don't get as much visible light transmitted through it. So it's a trade-off between you know, what you want on that. So again, it's influenced by the glazing type, like number of layers, is it single pane, double pane, triple pane, and any coatings that you put on. Uh, it's typically a, above 90%, so it's a percent, it's, uh, from zero to 100 a percent of what's coming in. So it's usually above 90% for nice clear glass. Um, maybe with these, I don't know. They look a little fuzzy to me. They're dirty. <laughs> that should say nice, clear, clean glass. Uh, and then if you have a lot of coatings on it, uh, it can be as low as 10%. I know in, you know, like in New York City, they have these very tall buildings. It's just very dark, very dark uh, glazing zone. And again, it's an important factor in providing daylight views and privacy, right? and also in controlling glare and uh, fading of furniture, right? Because the sunlight gets through, does that. So that's not directly related. To, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna look at any. Well, I am gonna report visible transmittance values, but it's not related to those heating and cooling loads. Okay. So overall energy flow through a fenestration product, assuming no humidity difference and excluding air filtration, so I'm not looking at those two, is this is the energy flow Q equals the overall heat transfer coefficient, the U factor or the U value, sometimes I call it, um, times the area of the fenestration system times the difference in the temperature. Okay, so that's sort of the overall heat transfer from the thermal part. And then you also have something due to the solar heat gain, right? So it'd be the solar heat gain coefficient, which is non-dimensional. So it's somewhere between zero and one, times the area, times the incident total irradiate, irradiate, irradiance, whatever's hitting, whatever radiation is hitting, some certain percentage of that will pass through um, as dictated by the solar heat gain coefficient. So these are two important properties when thinking about windows and thinking about aerogels, how does that help or hurt you uh, in there? And then in addition to that is a visible transmittance. How does that hurt you or help you? So um, these are pictures taken from uh, one of Professor Barati's and every Ben Francesca and Lisa's papers. Um, so one of the big areas that aerogels are used is in daylighting applications. So not visible, not windows that you can see through necessarily, but brings light in. So it'll light up the space. And so they've got these great pictures, and I don't know where they all are because I didn't get that part of the picture, but just great pictures, so external views and internal views of different buildings. Um, and this is a good example. So this from the inside, you can't really see out that. It's, they're so, somewhat opaque, but they let a lot of light in. Uh, they're often used in gymnasiums, uh, in um, big buildings where you don't, you know, you can have a, a, a building with a window that you can see through, and then on the top and bottom, you might have these sorts of glazes. And so these use, we talked earlier about the different forms of aerogels, you know, the granular, monolithic, or films people make. These use granular aerogels. They are very insulating, especially if you get thicker and thicker. Uh, they are opaque, so you can't typically see through them. Um, but they can bring in a, a lot of light. And so that's why they're called uh, daylighting in the daylighting application space. And so these are some nice examples. And these are some examples from the literature um, of different uh, air, granular aerogel glazings or windows. Um, so you can, so this picture here 
I think he, so I think in this case, he's, the granules come in different sizes. And so I think this is an example with the different sizes. And here's one, which is just a double glazing, no aerogel in the inner space, right? So you're filling that space inside of the aerogel, what you're doing. But you can see, and this is one, um, uh, from Hong Kong where they're doing, again, you, this one, you, this is not as thick. You can see, you can see through close up. Again, it depends on the thickness and the type of aerogel. And this is actually one from here. Uh, just an example of holding it up. So in all of these cases, you can make these granular uh, aerogel windows. Um, and in, this is a, also from this paper by Professor Barati and Elise and Francesca, um, showing U values. I love this plot because it really kind of lays out what's out there. So U values versus the thickness of your aerogel of your window. And these are all glazing systems. So they've got glazing systems with granular air gel in the um, circles. Uh, the X's are, they're polycarbonate instead of glass. And then the squares are ones with monolithic air gels. So, you know, the thicker you get, right? The thicker you get, the lower your trans. It's just a, it's just an insulating thing. You're insulating it. More insulation, lower you is what you're getting. Um, but you can't, like, I don't know what this one is exactly, but I don't think you can see through it. So where you really want to be on some of these is you'd love to be down here, thin, not taking up a lot of space, and low thermal transmittance. But that is not <laughs> the, but what I do, what we do see here is the few ones that are made for monoliths, uh, are a little better in terms of given that thickness. But there's also, you know, again, under normal conditions, the monoliths and the granules will perform similarly insulating wise. There's a difference if you evacuate it. Um, if you evacuate, you can get some of that. I think some of these might have that in there. And then also related to that is visible transmittance. And so these are all granular aerogels between sheets and uh, there's different, you can buy the granulars aerogels with different particle size. And so here again, they're looking at um, going up is just increasing in thickness. So it makes sense, I think, yeah. And so just showing the visible transitions, the thing is look how, how low it is, right? If you've got 10 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 35 millimeters, it is, um, you're really not getting as much light through, but you're getting great. You're getting some nice um, uh, thermal performance. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, so we started getting involved in this um, area back in 2013. And it was part of a program that I did through our national Science Foundation, which is the big funding agency for basic science and engineering research, uh, called the National Science Foundation. And they have a program, and you probably have a similar program to believe. They want researchers to get, they say, get out of the lab and talk to customers, talk to people who might be interested in developing whatever you're doing, which is kind of an interesting thing because. National Science Foundation is really about basic research, not applied, but they have these programs, which are great because we've, we've done them. So it's money they give you not to do any research and not to do technical work. Um, not, and then they, they say it's not about writing a business plan or raising funds. It's about this thing called uh, customer discovery and identifying market opportunities. And so it did this, so, and the curriculum is you work with their instructors to think about how could you take what you have made in the lab and get somebody interested in, in turning it into a commercial product. That's the idea. And so it's a fairly intense program. It's about seven weeks and you go there with a team. Somebody's the principal investigator. Uh, somebody's the entrepreneurial lead. 
And then you have a, a mentor, somebody who works in industry. So I did this in 2013. I was the PI. I had a student. He had just finished his bachelor's degree and was going to go to graduate school for a PhD. And he had six months. So he did this. And then we had a business mentor from industry to do it. And so this is a picture of, these are all the places. So when I did this then, because I've done this three times, at this time, you had to go in person. So the $50,000 was to fly places. So, you know, we were over here and we drove all over the East Coast and we went out West uh, to visit people. We did not go to Europe, but those I think were, were phone calls. They let you do some phone calls. But we talked to, and at this point, we had what we had is a way to make air, monolithic aerosols that was different from what other people did, right? It's different from the, uh, the CO2 supercritical drying method. And we thought, well, this is easier. Somebody must want to do something with this. And so we went out and talked to people in all different fields, you know. Um, car companies who talked to somebody who made uh, the big tents. Um, okay, for, for when you play football in the desert, you have like a big tent, yeah, canvas. Anyways, they were talking about aerogels and those because because they were talking about, isn't the, is the World Cup in Qatar? Yeah. Yes, it's gonna be very hot. So, <laughs> so anyways, that was one application somebody talked about. Did not happen to be an application for monolithic aerosols, but that's what I remember. So we talked to all these people, but in fact, the most successful interview we had was with he I think it was our first interview. We just we somebody he he works for a company, he worked for a company that made aerogel granular windows. Uh, advanced glazing it's called and so he said monolithic aerogels are the holy grail you know what that means like that's what we're searching for we need monolithic aerogels for the window and daylighting industry so that's where we started getting involved in these window pro in thinking about monolithic aerogels and so um and we were thinking about daylighting because when they're thick, they're not particularly trans, they're not, they're translucent, but they're not perfectly transparent. And nobody's going to use them as a, as a vision window. So we were thinking about daylighting and there had actually been a project. This is a EU project involved a lot of countries called the highlight program in like uh, 2000s. Um, and they made, these are monolithic aerogels uh, in a package. There's, I think they're roughly 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters at a company in Sweden called Airglass. Um, Airglass uses a CO2 supercritical extraction. I have a picture of their process. And they made these glazings. So it's glass aerogel glass so it's aerogel in the middle but it's monolithic not the granules and they evacuated they have these really low u values and i wonder if that's on that chart yeah it's got to be one of these down here on that chart so they have these very low u values doing that uh, they do this versus C with co2 supercritical extraction there's a big program a lot of really interesting work got done uh, this is a uh, okay this is some images from their final report on that project showing some of the technologies they developed. So this would be, they made the air gels, or they made the wet gels in between sort of glass panes. And then, I mean, how do you fill? You have to pour all that chemical in and get it to gel, et cetera. And so they, they developed a method for doing that. They would let it, they um, let it sit. That's how they molded it. Then they would let it sit in a, they, it sat in a bath of whatever solvent they were using, which I think had some kind of fluorocarbon in it, something. Um, 
and it would sit in age. They'd remove the glass, and then they, they had a way to store them. And then they would put it in. This is a, a thing of their um, of their CO2 system. So this is the big, this is an autoclave, really just a big, huge uh, pressure vessel. And they would stack these things in there. And they've got uh, a separator. Okay, ETAC is um, part of the precursor thing they use to separate that. Here's their CO2 storage tank. They've got a heater to heat the system, and they would flush it through with CO2. And they probably did some steps in between. Um, I think when they soaked it here, they did some solvent exchange. And so they would do this whole process. Um, interesting program. It I don't know, but it didn't continue. They stopped it. Um, I think they did a lot of very good work, but it's it still took. Uh, at least a week to make one of these. So from a production point of view, it's much slower. They increase their capacity. I think they, they're able to do more of them at once, but it still physically takes a long time to do all these processes. And when I was reading their description, I think it was about a week to do this. They didn't say, I carefully, they said they sped it up by going from six at a time to 12 at a time, but they still say it. I did read things like this sat here for two days, this process, they did show just doing this part would take a day or two because it's so big. So I'm going to take a break in a minute. Let me just get to this one. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. We'll go here and then I'll we'll take a break. So that's where we were in 2013. We could make these really beautiful little samples that you could put little chocolate chips on, <laughs> whatever you wanted to do, because really that's all we cared about. We were doing different things like... Uh, uh, using them, putting dyes and using them for sensors or uh, trying to strengthen them with uh, fibers in them. And so we didn't need anything big. So we could make these nice things back in 2013. But as a result of that program with the National Science Foundation, we said, oh, maybe what we have could be an advantage to making daylighting windows, still daylighting. So not trying to make vision windows. Uh, but to do that, we need to scale up to make larger models. So I think we should, anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so let's take, why don't we take a break and then I'm gonna come back, what I wanna, when we come back, I'm gonna go through. I assume you can still see the screen. Yes, that is the green bar there. Yeah, red bar, yes, yes. And today, at least they can hear me. Okay, so we needed to scale up. That's where I left off. You know, make these lovely, beautiful things. We had no desire to make anything much bigger than this. But then we got to um, trying to figure out if there are many challenges to scaling up and any any sort of thing. So we wanted to see if we could do that. So just a little review again of that technique we use. This is our hot press. It is. It has a name. It is named Ragel. Do any of you watch Game of Thrones? Do they have Game yes. of Thrones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you watch it in Italian or in yeah, English? Yeah, yeah, I watch it in English. Ah, Ragel is the big dragon. Dra Ragel and oh, we're sorry. Ragel, no, Drogon is the big. Oh, okay. Ragel is the other one. Anyways, yeah, okay, okay, okay. When you cool this, steam okay. comes out. So we have two of them. One has more steam than the other, so one's Drogon and one's Regal. <laughs> How do you say Game of Thrones in Italian? Okay. Anyways, this is the hot press. These are the platens. This is where we put the mold with the aerogels. This is the controls. This is a ventilation system because we do release some methanol uh, gas. When we do. Anyways, inside of that, here are the details. This is a metal mold. I'll talk more about those, but when we're making some of the bigger, when we made the smaller samples, this metal mold might be uh, 15 to 20 centimeters on the side, and we'd have little holes cut into it. But now we want to make them bigger, so we're making these bigger cutouts in here. And we pour the chemicals in there, and we have gasket 
uh, to seal. We have a metal foil and graphite. The metal foil keeps things from sticking. And the graphite is a little, it, graphite can take the high temperature and it's a little compressive. So it gives us a good seal. And so uh, when we use this, we, we have a, we program in a, a, a series of steps for the hot press to go through. So we pour the chemicals in, push the button and go away and come back, you know, five or six hours and we have our air gel. Um, so again, the, the steps that we program, the steps that the hot press does is it seals first, that's when we close. So this is press force is in blue and the temperature is in green. And this is the time. So the first thing we do is we seal it and then we start to heat it. And so in the beginning, we know from studies, I, I showed you some of the optical mold we used, where we video, where we looked through the window as the, as the gel was forming. We know that it gels in the first hour. And then we say the next step is it, it um, strengthens and ages. Again, uh, other people, when they do the supercritical extraction by CO2, they have to let it gel and they have to let it shrink so they can get it out of the container and then put it in with the CO2. Ours do not shrink, which is a feature of ours. Okay, so we're here and we've heated it up and then we do the extraction. So here's where the press force, we just slowly release it. Okay, that's the supercritical extraction step. And we maintain high temperature during that because we need to be at the supercritical state and then the last step is just to cool down. Okay, so it's just cooling everything in there. All right, the press force is low and the- I, I don't remember anymore. In your technique, do you add the solvent exchange? No, 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 no. Uh, not for silica. When we make some of the catalytic aerogels, we do. But the when we want to make the monoliths, no. no. So that's what's rapid about it. So this is literally, it takes half an hour to mix the chemicals, yeah. not even, and put it in, press a, press a button, and then six hours later, we have an aerogel. The trick is, is it monolith? It's, it's hard to make the monolith. That's, we'll have aerogel, but it might be crap. You'll see some examples. So what is happening, again, in our process, as we heat, we reach what's called a takeoff point. And that's the, so this is again, pressure versus temperature. And this is, we often have a, we have a sensor on our mold that measures the pressure and temperature of everything inside. So that's where we get this, this information from. So we see when we make the aerogels, this is the typical uh, trace we get for pressure versus temperature. So it reaches this, we call a takeoff point, and that's where the pressure starts shooting up. And we learned, we did some studies with filling the mold, different amounts and things like that. That's basically, that occurs, it, that could happen way out here. We could go, the, the process could do this and then take off. Um, if you fill the mold all the way, it's, it's what's happening is when the, the liquid inside expands to fill the space. As soon as it fills the whole mold space, then the pressure rises as you keep heating. So if we only fill the mold halfway, the trace might look like this, follow that, and then go up. So we know how to control that. Then we see this right here. It gets up to some pressure, and then it sort of flattens out. Sometimes it goes up a little more, something maybe seals a little bit. We call that the leak point. And so what is happening is we are um, we have a little bit of the gas leaking out. Um, the super it's not quite supercritical temperature. It's supercritical pressure um, begins to leak, and that is based on the force. So on the hot press, this is a and I I, oh, I do probably know the units. It's sixty thousand pounds. Uh, I think I have another slide, how many kilonewtons it is. This is, this is the maximum it can do. And so depending on what that is, we'll, we'll hit this. We don't want it too high because if it's too high, we'll get to really high pressures in the mold and we don't want it low. 
because then we won't get super critical. So we want it somewhere between 10 and 15 uh, megapascals. That's the pressure inside the mold. And it's a function of the force. And I'll show you, I have another picture here. So what's happening, here's my mold. And this mold has a, sometimes the molds are open on the bottom. Sometimes they're, they're not. So this one is shown as not. But what's happening is the pressure is rising here in this space. And that pressure times the area of the mold pushes on, it pushes back against the hot, the hot press. And when it gets too high or high enough, it creates a leak path, it leaks out. So if it gets high enough, it leaks out and it leaks some of the gas, pressure kind of drops and then it's fine. And so you get some leaking. And so what we know is the force from the mold, which is the pressure times the area, when that is about equal to the hot press force applied, then we will get, we will, this is what will happen. And we can control when that happens because we know a little bit. It's not exact because uh, the gas that leaks out is a little um, sticky. So it, you'll see it'll, it'll seal better, sticky. Like it, it creates more of a seal. So, so that's why we see a little rise here. Um, so what we know is the size of the monolith is limited by the maximum press force. We, so this thing in reality is 12, 24, 30 centimeters. 12 inches. Yeah, 30 centimeters. But we cannot make an aerogel that big because we don't have enough force. So um, these are sort of the typical processing parameters. So here we go. It's like 267 kilonewtons is about my maximum force. So we use these are so our first step, the temperature is just sort of room temperature. We don't really heat anything. And then we apply a force there. We tell it 200 kilonewtons or 267 kilonewtons. I think 267 is our max. Um, and that depends on the size of our mold because it depends on pressure times area. And then we usually just, so sometimes we have what's called, so five things we control, temperature setting, heating and cooling rate. So how fast it heats or cools, that actual force, the force rate, and then we call it a dwell time. Sometimes after a step, we just wait. So here in this case, sometimes we, at the very first step, all we've done is applied the force. We let it sit there. And sometimes we do that to let it gel, depending on what we're making. Sometimes that's, that dwell time is zero. But that, what I've, what I've put in, in um, yellow are the things we have to play with in our process. So then we heat. We use 288, the supercritical temperature of uh, methanol. I know what it is in Fahrenheit. It's it's uh, it's probably 260. See, we go above that. Uh, that is in Fahrenheit. No, this this is all in C. This is okay. in C. I know we pro the, uh, the, the, the <laughs> I do not always, but the hot press is is in an American hot press, all in Fahrenheit okay, and pounds. Okay, so I'm always having to convert back and forth. But anyways, this is well above the supercritical temperature of methanol, but that's because we actually, if you remember back on the aerogel chemistry, after it gels, you have methanol and water. And water has a much higher supercritical Oh, here we go. Yeah, so it's about two, 220. What, but we can't possibly, that, that's too dangerous. So we, we found that about 288 works pretty well. And then we can change the rate at which we heat and cool. So we can heat it. We go from one to, we've gone even higher than, we've gone up to five. I'm going to show you some results. Degrees C per minute. So that's just how fast it heats up. And again, we can control that force. We keep it, we keep the force on there. 
And then after that step, we often wait. And again, it's waiting to let everything equilibrate, become equilibrium, because those temperatures are the temperatures of the, of the hot press, not necessarily the mold. So we're letting everything diffuse in, make sure everything's uniform, et cetera. And we found that matters. So, okay, the next step is extract. And that is where we now lower the force. Yes. When you, when you do this waiting time. Yes. Do you release the force? No, nope. no, it's, it, no, you can't. So if we do, we can. If you do it, well, nothing, yeah. We so we just sit time. there, yes, yes. So now we release the force, okay? We go all the way down, basically to zero. Um, and we can control the rate that we do that at. So how fast, we, if we did it really fast, it would be bad because everything would, would come out, yes. So um, we can control that. And actually, you can see that right here. What's happening, we lower it, nothing happens, lower it a little more, nothing happens, lower it a little more, nothing happens. And then you get to one point where it starts to slowly escape. And, and then- You see a leaking. Yes, and if we just if we knew exactly when it leaked, we could then go really fast, but we still don't show that. And then at the end of that, we often wait just to let all the supercritical fluid release. And then the next step is just to cool it. And so these are the things we can control. We can control the maximum hot press restraining force, um, which is this, but only up to what it can do. We can control these heating and cooling rates. We can control the force release rate and the dwell times. And so we did some work to look at that. These are, let me see, these are three, these are like eight centimeters on the side and uh, 1.5, 1.3 centimeters thick yes and so we just here's just showing you if we in keeping everything else the same if we change the force that we have here we see something like this too low we get these cracks okay raise it more still have some cracks if it's high enough we get a nice this is looking through the aerogel we get a pretty good aerogel not it's not perfect because the process there's a lot of variability in the process, but in general, we increase it. We've not ever reached the point of too much force for this size, but I, I think it's because our press can't go any higher. And then here's where we increase heating and cooling rates. Um, this one is, that's the snow in the background some years ago, but this was 2.2 degree C per minute, 3.3, 4.4, 5.6. So if you go too fast, you get these cracks, things like that. A lot of this is also dependent on the mold you use and everything else, but we, you know, we sort of settled. We don't, I think now we're typically in this range is what we're doing because this will work, but then it won't work. So for consistency, we go slower. Um, so then we, we thought we had, the first idea we had to make them bigger. So we, we went from the little few centimeter size things to now this sort of eight centimeter by eight centimeters. So we're very happy with that, but then we that's still not big enough. So then we thought, how about if we use these honeycomb inserts? That was our first idea. So these are nine by nine by 1.2. And then these are 14 by 14 by 1.2 for the size. You know, we're just putting these, you can buy this stuff, but and we got it to work, so we we're happy about that. We could make these monoliths. We could make bigger ones. Um, but then we said, let's try not doing it. <laughs> and we made one. So we were then able to make them this size, which is about the maximum. So 14 centimeters by 14 centimeters times the pressure we want inside just about equals the maximum force that we get on our hot press. So it's, we're kind of at the limit there with what we can do. Uh, and then we also did it under vacuum. So we we put, this is two pieces of glass uh, with a with one of these aerogels in between and we pulled a vacuum on it. We actually made it in a vacuum chamber and sealed it in a vacuum chamber. And so we did some U-value testing on these. So these would be like center of glass. 
So again, you want, and I did these in uh, SI units. In the US, the units are crazy. Anyways, as you can imagine, these things are great, but they're metal, right? So we were hoping they're aluminum. Uh, and then I think these ones might be stainless steel. We were hoping uh, the cross-section where it'd be small. So you can see this is um, pretty high U value with the aluminum. And then when we went to the stainless steel, it got much better. So we've lowered that. Um, and this is the this is how we got to none of them. We went to bigger and bigger. And suddenly we said, oh, let's just do this and see if we can make a monolith, right? And they were like, okay, let's do nothing. And we when we got to that. So and then so no inserts were down here, really good U values, about one. So these are quite low. And then the evacuated um, is even lower, maybe 0. 0.6 or so here. And one is just a more of a vacuum than the other, is the difference between those two. Um, so we were happy with that, where we got to with that. We were able to put together four of these things into kind of an IGU. Now we've got 18 by 18 centimeters. The problem that we have, if you look right there, um, I don't have a good picture of this, but our mold, you can't make a perfectly square edge when you machine it. There's a radius on the edge. Radi so, so these aerogels, when they come out, so you can see here, there's a little bit, it's not, it's not perfectly square. Mm -hmm. okay. So when you join four of them together, that is a hole, not very insulated when you have just an air gap. So, but this was our first one we made. So we were, again, we were happy. You could even see through it. I mean, you could see more than you can see through granules. It's not perfect, obviously. Um, we also looked at uh, the a, a thing that's of concern is the effect of water on these materials. So these air gels we were making, these ones are, hydrophilic. There's no chemical processing to make them repel water. And that can be dangerous. And this just kind of shows you, you put a piece of water drop on there and wait it a little bit. And that's what happens to the air gel. We saw that in the movie of the chocolate, the, the moisture turns it white. Basically, it's just destroying the structure. So we did some work to add a methyl trimethoxy silane to the material. And this just shows you, once you do that, that's a water droplet on an aerogel surface, it beads up beautifully. It's very hydrophobic. But you pay a price because when you do that, you can see here, we made another one like this, but we have different tiles or different mon monoliths with different hydrophobicity. So 5% means we add 5% by volume, MTMS, uh, 10 and 20. And the 20, you can, it's almost opaque, right? It's the 20 there. You can see through the others, but it's not as good. And if you do, if you look at the the way the transmission percent transmitted versus wavelength in the visible range, you can see how poorly that does when you have. So that's a bit of a challenge. The five is maybe okay, and, and we haven't really gone back to um, uh, seeing what the minimum is we can on that. Uh, then we started, actually, and around this time is when we met Professor Barati and started collaborating with the University of Perugia. And we've made, then we made two larger assemblies uh, that are 30 by 30 centimeters. And they are, this one is one we made at Union. Both these were made at Union. This is one we made under a New York State uh, Energy Research Development Agency contract. Um, where we have to tile these aerogels. Again, they're not overly beautiful in any way. Um, 13 millimeter thick aerogel and 6.4 millimeter glass. And then we made this one to send here. And Professor Barati did a lot of testing on it for us. And this one is 15 millimeter thick aerogels and 4.7 millimeter thick glass. Um, and you and one of the things we got a little better at was we learned to laser cut the edges so that you don't have rounded edges, you laser cut. When you laser cut though, you get a little discolor, you get some discoloration. I, I'll talk about laser cutting on Tuesday. Um, but the one we tested, this one in New York, had a U value of about 0.9, which again is very good. And the one what was sent here was tested at a U value of about 0.99. They're a little different 
construction on there. So um, those are both very good. So we're very happy with that. But they're not the best looking materials. So in 2020, during the pandemic, <laughs> I did uh, i -Corps again. This time was not interviewing people in person because we couldn't. <laughs> but it was good because we just, we, it's better to do it in person, but it's a lot of travel to do it in person. So we did some in person things. So what happened? So where we had been going with this work was that daylighting, right? We can make daylighting materials. You know, uh, Sunthrough is a startup that uh, Professor Carol and I founded. And actually, this student and another student have come back and they're like running it now. Um, but initially, when we went to do i -Corps again, because we got some funding from the National Science Foundation for research, and then we could do i -Corps again. We thought, well, this process is fast. We can make these translucent materials. Faster way to bake them than anyone else has. We're going to go with the same thing, you know, this thing, but we're going to make them bigger. We're going to make bigger aerogels um, and go with that. And so we did i -Corps and we did 102 interviews. They'd like you to do 100, so we were glad we got 102, mostly online. And this is what we... Um, heard from these big glass window companies. So Guardian Glass said, if someone could make a transparent insulator, that would be a game changer. Somebody at Burrow Happold, uh, uh, I think they're architecture, you guys may have heard of them. If someone wanted daylighting products, Calwell would be selling more units. Calwell is a, a company in the United States that makes uh, granular filled air gel windows. Um, and they probably made some of the ones on the pictures at the beginning. Um, and they were saying, well, but they're not selling tons of units, so people don't really want daylighting products. And this, this guy at a glass company in um, Philadelphia said people buy windows so they can see outside of the building. And then Advanced Glazing, another company that does the granular, they make really wide granular filled air gel panels. Say, I want a more transparent air gel than the ones I can currently buy. So we decided to try to change the focus from daylighting to thinner aerogels that could be more transparent. So again, this was just really interesting to me to just go and see what people are, it was really good. I'm fundamentally a researcher, but I'm really interested in what people want because it can drive the um, stuff more. So we did some more work. We made some new aerogel molding. This is, we call it our three-piece mold. And actually we used this sort of mold to make, uh, uh, I don't think we we're using it with this one yet. We made these that way. Uh, it has three pieces so that you can take the top and the bottom off and get the aerogel out. The aerogels don't shrink very much. In fact, we have to make them shrink so we can get them out. So, you know, I mean, they shrink like they just, it, if I take it out of the mold, it's stuck all the way around and it's hard to do. So we did this. The other thing is that we don't have the gasket material, the graphite and stainless steel, which sometimes stuck. We just have these flat surfaces. And we have to condition the surfaces. We use vacuum grease. So you have to be very careful about making the aerogels. Um, but we did that and we made it so that we could make first five millimeter thick aerogels and then three, like technically 2.9 millimeter thick aerogels. So, so the two things we did, thinner, obviously if it's thinner, you're gonna be able to see through it better. But we also played with the chemical recipe. And the big thing we used, this was sort of our original recipe. This is that TMOS, methanol, water, and the catalyst, ammonia. This is sort of what we originally used to make the aerogels. And then we tried, to use a lot more catalyst. Uh, increasing the catalyst uh, changes the way the hydrolysis and condensation happens and it changes the structure. Um, can cause problems if you increase too much and it gels before we put it in the hot press, then we can't make, we can't make it. Um, and it also tends to make them a little more fragile so these are, it's hard, uh, the only thing I can tell you is you're looking at this blue gloved hand through an aerogel. 
and you can see quite well uh, through those. So these are the different recipes, um, but they became more fragile as you put more catalysts in, so harder to work with. We, um, so they look nice, but this is the data then for the five millimeter aerogels. This is that percent transmittance versus wavelength. And again, this is just the visible range. And so these are the ones we were originally making way over here on the right, which had an overall sort of average transmittance over this range of 78%, which is pretty good. But by changing and playing with the chemical recipe on this, we were able to get up to almost 90% um, on the one recipe. We ended up going forward with this recipe here, which got us to 87% transmission, the yellow one. Just because it was a little bit stronger, we thought that, that this one was just too weak to, to work with. Um, and then we went even thinner. We went first went to five. And yeah, we didn't know if we could make them thin because it's, again, it's a handling problem. But now we can make them three millimeters. And here is um, that transmittance spectra. Uh, these are the original 15 millimeter ones. Okay, only about 42%. Uh, then the five millimeter, same as was on the last 87, and I had to three, and now it's at 94%, which is excellent, excellent uh, transmittance for these things. So, you know, it's approaching glass. Um, the, so to get there, two things we did, we played with the chemistry and we went thin and we made these aerogels um, that we can make and can sort of handle. They are fragile, um, but they can do that. You can also heat treat them. And I, I want to include the picture here. So before heat treatment is the blue, and then after heat treatment, you get, you get a little bit. If you have a, a, the thicker ones, you get more, better response to that. But if you heat treat it, what you're doing is you often have some adsorbed solvent. So after you make it, not all the solvent escapes. So you can drive that off. And just 45 minutes at 425, um, you can improve the transmittance. We did a test and then we left it out in the lab. Because uh, again, it, these are not hydrophobic, these are hydrophilic. We left it in the lab and it did adsorb a little bit more, but it was still quite good after heat treatment, so even more. And so this is looking through, you know, this picture of our not memorial, and we're looking through a piece of aerogel, um, which is nice. This is a little black around the edges because we laser cut that piece of aerogel. Okay, so we did make a prototype with the five millimeter ones. And then here's that 13 millimeter one. So that previous one I showed you, here's the five. It doesn't, the lighting is funny on this picture because these are, this with the five millimeter, you're about 78% of the light in the visible. And with this, it's about 45% of the light in the visible ring. So the problem is though, so the U value of this is 2.5 versus this was 0.9. I mean, it's thinner. You're going to get a thinner, you're not going to get, so it's a trade off. You know, originally with this stuff, we went this way because we thought, the insulating people would take the lower transmission, light transmission, uh, because of the high U value. But then when we talk to these companies that make windows, they're like, no, I want to be able to see through them. You know, nope, nope, they're not interested in this. Because I think if you're going to have daylight, you might as well do the granules. They're cheaper to make, they're easier to make. Uh, so it was sort of like either see through it or not. So that's what pushed us in this direction. This is a little high. This was not a, there's some thermal bridging in this, but this is not, was not a very good prototype, but we did something to get it tested. And so we're there. So what's next is what we're trying to do is move towards something called a thin triple. So triple pane wind. So the most efficient windows are triple pane, three pieces of glass. They are very heavy. They are very wide. Um, and they are very expensive. I don't know how they're not used in the U.S. much. People don't. It's too expensive. You know, five or ten percent of the windows, maybe. I don't know what's used here. 
So the idea is instead of three pieces of window pane, the, the third piece is going to be an aerogel. This is going to be more insulating than a triple pane, and it can be thinner than a triple pane. So it'll be a double pane with an aerogel in between it is the idea. And this, in fact, this is one right here. That is looking through. That is a piece of glass, aerogel, glass. And we're looking through it. So it's got very good um, uh, light transmittance. We haven't tested these for their thermal ability yet, but we predict it will be better than, um, it will definitely be better than a double pane. Um, there's challenges in dealing with, you know, these fragile aerogels to do that. All that said, this is still only sort of 14 centimeters by 14. So the other thing is uh, large, we're building a larger hot press so that we can make bigger samples. And that's kind of the, the next thing that we do in that. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Yes, good. And something that I, I, don't, I don't know, it's typically in double pane windows. Yes. Uh, between the windows, there is air or vacuum? But they do both. So, or there's argon, which has a lower thermal conductivity, or krypton they also use. The problem with those, they're good, but it, sometimes they leak. So if you yeah, could, if you, if you, yeah, if you, they, that, yes, they can leak over time. I mean, they are, they are good, but you can also do that. You know, this could be evacuated also, or it could yeah, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. And another question, I don't know if, if it's possible to calculate or not, because I'm not an engineer, so I guess yeah. that there is the, the U value for the air. Yes. And it's, uh, if you can go to the previous slide. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't meant to do <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let's see. Wait, is it still shared? No, we unshared it. <laughs> I okay. didn't want to do the show. No, no. <laughs> Hold on. Let's see tomorrow and then share it again. There we go. Okay. You wanted uh, there was a slide, uh, the last slide when you showed us that the, the three, yeah. three millimeter stick and the fifteen millimeter stick are two different U values. Yeah, yeah, this one. What yes. I want to ask is if you know the U value of the air, if the U value of the air is still higher than two point five six. Oh yes, yes, it will be higher than two point five. Yes, it will. But okay, so the thing with air is if there is a space, the air can move. So you have your air conduct. First of all, the thermal conductivity of the air gel is lower than air. So that's going to lower. But in addition, air can move, which raises its effective thermal conductivity. So that's why you're getting a better performing material when you do that. Yeah. And I don't remember if I asked this yesterday or the other day, but so. Uh, we said that hydrogen is 98 percent. Yes. Uh, yes. And but it has uh, a U value lower than that. Yes. Air. Yes. Is this due to the Nansen number? Yes, because it's interacting with the solid. So the thing is that the the hydrogen is air, but more labyrinth. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because there's there's so many. The solid is spread out, okay. and then you get the Newton effect, so you don't get the air, the same conductivity. Yeah. Like raising the air. Yes, so yes, it's controlling what's happening there. I had the last question, and then I stopped reading. No, you're good. <laughs> uh, so you know that, that your limit is for in the production of the square yes. pieces of the air that is like 14 centimeters yeah. or 14. Is this due to the fact that you are, don't have a large hot press? Yes, it's due to it's due to. So my hot press could, could do more than fourteen. It could do thirty. It's big enough, but the force. But the force. Yes, because yeah. if I guess I get bigger. Like 60, 60, yes, right. If I get if I try to make bigger than fourteen by fourteen, the pressure, pressure times area is bigger. Okay. So that's what I and that and I'm just my last slide anyway. So that's why now we're trying to make a. Okay. Yes, that's that's the thing. It's not necessarily bigger. I should say higher. Well, it is going to be bigger because we need to make 